Vitamin D affects a lot more than just your immune system. And everything that vitamin D affects, if you compare the symptoms of vitamin D deficiency with the symptoms of severe COVID-19, they match up almost perfectly. So for instance, just getting COVID-19 in the first place, vitamin D strengthens the epithelial junctions, the tight junctions, the gap junctions, the junctions between cells. So you're less likely to have an invader, such as the, SARS, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, even enter the system if you have vitamin D levels high. You're, you're basically, your, your walls surrounding your city will be strengthened by having good vitamin D. And so a lot of people are not ever going to even test positive if they've got a good vitamin D level. Then your T cell immunity is strengthened and controlled. So you're more likely to have an appropriate reaction to the invader rather than having an overreaction where you, you know, burn all your powder too quickly and then don't have anything left or you do catastrophic damage to yourself because you're just shooting wildly. Um, So vitamin D helps with the adaptive immunity as well as the innate immunity. And then it also controls um, some complicated things that we don't need to go into like the renin angiotensin system. And uh, so there are other more complex systems within the body that go out of control in COVID-19 that vitamin D helps regulate and keep in control. And one of the things that's gotten a lot of press lately has been the fact that with severe COVID-19, you get thrombolytic events. You get uh, blood clots that do a lot of damage. In fact, most of the damage from severe COVID-19 is not just damage in the lungs, but also you get damage in the various other organs because of blood clots. And those blood clots aren't formed by the virus itself. They're caused by the overreaction to the the virus and vitamin D controls that system and helps prevent those blood clots. Fascinating. And then the number of mechanisms that were already known pertinent to uh, this particular disease. I mean, I'm, I'm, I've got a document, I think I'm, I'm running up to nearly 10 that I know about now. There are dozens and, and vitamin D is well known to control, I think now more than 20,000 genes in the body. So it's, it's, it's one of the most ubiquitous and, uh, and important hormones of all of the hormones. I mean, every hormone is important, but it's, uh, and, and I think it's probably worth clarifying that the, the D3 version that we eat is several metabolic steps away from the active form. And what we measure when we call the active form actually isn't the active form. There's another one, another step further down. So you'll hear calcitriol or calcitriol is as the active form, but it's actually calcitriol, which is the form that's used in cells to initiate all of the immune responses um, that that help you uh, with vitamin D. But the the mechanisms are really well understood. I've written about them. Many other researchers have written about them. Um, And and so it's really baffling to understand why people would question, given the level of evidence coming, I mean, the triangulation that you can get, if you look at this from all the different angles, from biological plausibility, from uh, t- temporal, the, all of the geographic data around the world, ecological studies, longitudinal studies, um, you know, there's, there's four decades of research behind vitamin D that's just being ignored. Um, and part of it's snobbery because it's food science, you know, there's a historic uh, weight around vitamin D's leg. Part of it is, I think, I mean, the, the, the literature is littered with statistical mistakes and bad analyses and things like that, which don't help. But if you yeah. have a good grounding in stats and, and, and uh, can understand numbers and data, it's pretty easy to clear the fog away and see the, see the real picture that's there. Well, I do think that we can excuse a lot of the doctors who are not on board with vitamin D because they don't have the time, most of them, no. to dig into the the basic literature themselves. They rely upon their medical societies and and the, the various guidelines, you know, up to date and the various guidelines in order to get their information. And uh, about 10 years ago or so, uh, the vitamin D clarion call was very loud. And this is the time when my uh, friend in Alaska was testing every single patient for vitamin D. And uh, vitamin D Uh, Testing at that time was covered by Medicare and groups like that. 
But what happened is after that, they did these population studies in which they used the USRDA as the amount of vitamin D they were going to supplement with. They were very poorly designed studies with a very uh, uh, primitive understanding or not a very adequate understanding of how vitamin D works. And so they uh, supplemented people with way less vitamin D than they should have. They supplemented them for a shorter amount of time than they should have. And they uh, 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 supplemented people who were already vitamin D sufficient as well as people who were deficient. And so that would dilute the uh, results. And so it'd be a little bit like I, the example I give is um, we all know that amoxicillin uh, is extremely effective against strep throat. To this day, we don't have severe resistance for amoxicillin against strep throat. That's what everybody uses. 500 milligrams three times a day is the accepted dose. If we instead gave people in a study five milligrams of amoxicillin three times a day, and then had another group, which we didn't give any amoxicillin at all, we could easily prove that amoxicillin is not useful at all for strep throat. And so they basically disproved vitamin D being useful with studies that inadequately dosed people and were poorly designed. And those studies were very widely accepted. And as a result, the uh, physicians were given the message, oh, this vitamin D thing looked good, but we've disproven it. It's really a bunch of nothing. And so a lot of the uh, physicians now, when they hear about vitamin D, they say, oh, fool me once. You're not going to fool me twice. I know this vitamin D thing is just a few zealots. It doesn't really work. And um, Martineau did a study in 2017 that's probably the most widely cited study for vitamin D, in which what he did was he took all the studies that had been poorly designed from uh, vitamin D uh, going back and did a meta-analysis in which he looked at individual patient data. It was a massive study and showed with this meta-analysis data that, oh, but if you use high enough doses and you don't give the boluses, but rather you give it daily or weekly, you do get a dramatic effect on uh, respiratory viruses. In fact, respiratory viruses in the elderly are cut in half. Influenza rates uh, death rates could be cut in half with vitamin D supplementation. And that did get some attention. So uh, that study, to me, the big takeaway on it is you have to look at the studies and see whether or not they were designed appropriately to get meaningful results. Right. Or uh, as we've seen in some of the COVID literature, there is a a go-to move if you want to avoid the impression that something works, the underpowered study. And so I don't know in the case that you cite whether or not uh, treating with uh, such a meager dose of vitamin D in a population that may already be sufficient was uh, intentional sabotage or simply an accident. But the fact is, it is all too possible to generate the impression that something highly effective isn't effective at all if you design the study in such a way that it doesn't reveal the effect. Um, That's right. So underpowered studies. I'm I'm looking at the evidence. I mean, I've noticed this phenomenon over and over again. People will, and and in fact, NICE did this when they looked at the, the, they first did their review, which, uh, you know, at the time, I think I counted 8,000 results on Google Scholar for vitamin D and coronavirus. And then they came out with a review that looked at five studies. They actually did put our paper in an appendix of studies that we wouldn't consider because it was a preprint. Um, although Martineau then applied for some grant funding using it. So it was good enough for him to apply for money, uh, but not good enough to tell the world that, you know, vitamin D was a, a thing to do. Um, but the if, if, if you, I, I use a, a metaphor, which is a, if you have detectives, you've got some good detectives and some bad detectives, and you tell them to investigate a murder, and five of them go to the house and see the murder weapon and know, so find the blood and the victim, and the other five go down to the pub or look in their kitchen or in their own, you know, their own, or have a beer or whatever. They're going to come back with different reports. Some are because of incompetence and laziness, uh, and some might be just corrupt. You can't take five studies that show strong evidence and then five studies that didn't provide evidence and somehow say those no evidence studies cancel out the positive evidence from the first five but very often in the literature and i think this is true in medicine in general 
Studies that report ev no evidence of effect are immediately interpreted as evidence of no effect, which is a completely different statement. And you need, you can make a study that can prove there's no effect within a certain tolerance, but you have to have incredibly high power. I'm not aware of any study that's done that. Uh, the hasty biobank study claimed to have done it, but that was statistical fiction. We, Linda and I collaborated with the, um, a, a physicist to uh, take down that paper and point out that they they just artificially inflated. They had about a thousand data points and they, they claimed it. They had nearly half a million by mislabeling a whole load of extra data. And I mean, I've never read a worse piece of science in my life. I don't know how that got published. Um, it just shows how broken peer review is. And, and the number of studies that quote that study, the reason we went to the trouble of, of, of rebutting it uh, formally was because people were still quoting it a year later. And it's it's blatantly wrong. And, and I don't understand how anyone could read it and take it seriously. But it's it's taken seriously all the time. Yeah, we, we see this pattern uh, across the COVID literature and um, it's very, well, let's put it this way. You know, the story is, well, we don't have enough evidence that vitamin D or ivermectin uh, works, and therefore we're advising caution because of the danger of using it. Well, what if there is no danger because these things are comparatively safe? Well, there is a danger, and then you look into the evidence of that, and it isn't really evidence. But then you see something like fluvoxamine right? Which has now been demonstrated to be highly effective against COVID and there's no move uh, evident to make it the standard of care. So the point is, well, it seems like actually you don't want things that work to be used because, you, and you're just using the fact that you don't think the evidence is good enough to explain why you're not using these things. And the way we can tell is that when you have something that does meet your standard of evidence, you still don't use it, right? So- <laughs> Sometimes the sometimes the politics get in the way and the politics are just unbelievable. If you look at what's happened with monoclonal antibodies in the United States, monoclonal antibodies have been around and have been had emergency use use authorization. They're very expensive, but they did work since January of 2021. But very few states were using them and they weren't very well publicized. Well, the governors of Texas and Florida, you know, the two states that are flouting a lot of the uh, uh, restriction lockdown kind of things, both highly endorsed monoclonal antibodies and started opening up monoclonal antibody centers so that anybody who wanted them could easily access monoclonal antibodies. So what happens next? Monoclonal antibodies are suddenly um, regulated. The distribution becomes regulated by the federal government and they start and they forbid the companies from shipping to Florida or Texas because they say we need to distribute these equitably across all the states. So these states that aren't interested in monoclonal antibodies have stockpiles of them while Texas and Florida are shorted. Which even if they were to distribute those and use them, this will prevent you from accumulating the evidence that they work. Right. If Texas and Florida start allowing anybody who wants monoclonal antibodies to use them and they suddenly have low rates of covid harm from people who have been infected, then that would raise the question of whether the rest of the state should get on board. On the other hand, if you distribute these things in such a way that the effect is diluted and nobody has a very strong effect because they're so widely distributed, you won't see that pattern and you can uh, dismiss dismiss this potentially important curative agent uh, and, you know, basically right. rationalize your is, failure to use it. Yeah. And the whole thing is, is you've got something that's very strongly preventative for severe COVID-19 hospitalizations and death, whether it's vitamin D, ivermectin, monoclonal antibodies, whatever, then you lose the rationale for emergency use authorization for the vaccines. The vaccines because would seem no to be the- it's no longer an emergency. Right, it's, and so we have this one therapy, which clearly the public health authority has uh, signed up for and uh, will entertain no evidence that it was an error. Um, and we have all sorts of other things on the table from fluvoxamine to vitamin D uh, to monoclonal antibodies, which are, you know, uh, just unable to get a proper hearing. 